somehow largely two-lane highways or highways where cell phone service drops out, there are sections where if you get behind a semi, you can't pass it. What I found in my reporting is that what we expect from a hospital isn't necessarily what a hospital provides. Hmm. Across the U.S., especially in rural America, many of these hospitals, these are acute care centers. Rural America has been hard hit in recent decades. The latest symptom of its malaise, many of the hospitals that serve its residents are closing. I'm Sarah Fenske. This is St. Louis on the Air. More than 130 rural hospitals have closed in the U.S. in the past decade. That's a health crisis that small towns and rural outposts in Missouri and Illinois were grappling with long before the coronavirus pandemic. Missouri alone has lost seven rural hospitals since 2014. But what happens when a rural hospital closes? That's the focus of a new podcast called Where It Hurts. It takes a close look at the shuttering of Mercy Hospital in Fort Scott, Kansas, which sits on the Kansas-Missouri border. Where It Hurts is a production of Kaiser Health News and St. Louis Public Radio. And joining us today to talk about it is its host, that's Sarah Jane Tribble. So, Sarah Jane, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So this podcast is is very interesting. There's so much you, you're able to get at um, through the story of this hospital. In the very first episode, you followed the story of Ralph and Pat Wheeler. Who are they and, and what were they facing when Mercy Hospital closed? Right. So Ralph Wheeler grew up in Fort Scott. He was born there. He's a native and he's in his 70s. His wife, Pat, is in her 60s. I met her outside of a a used bookstore in downtown Fort Scott. She was smoking a Marlboro and we chatted and she um, she has COPD and emphysema. And so does Ralph. Ralph also has um, congestive heart failure and his kidneys are failing. Mm -hmm. So when Mercy Hospital closed, he was in the middle of another heart incident um, right about the same time. He ended up going to Joplin, Missouri for some of that care. And um, they both believe that some of his step-down care, some of the care he needed for his other ailments would have been easier if uh, the Mercy Hospital had stayed open. They believe their lives would have been easier. You mentioned that they um, had to go to Joplin for some of this treatment. How how long of a drive is that? Let's see if I remember this correctly. I think it's about an hour, uh, hour and a half from Fort Scott. Okay, so that's a bit of a haul if you're having some sort of serious health problem. Um, I know you also mentioned that at least 230 babies were delivered at this hospital every year before it closed. What do you do if you go into labor and you're in a, a situation where you have to, say, drive to Joplin? Well, in uh, Fort Scott, there is another town that's a little bit closer, a couple of small hospitals and rural communities near there. They're about 30 minutes away, 20, 30 minutes away. And I think that that sounds like it's not much to folks who live in a city and they have to travel. But if you think about rural communities and where they're at and the landscape there, we're talking about largely two-lane highways or highways where cell phone service drops out. There are sections where if you get behind a semi, you can't pass it. Mm -hmm. So in one of the episodes, one of the chapters, episodes, we talked to a mom who was employed at Mercy Hospital and expecting her second baby. She lost her job, and she lost the place where she was planning on having a very kind of personalized delivery of her second child. Um, and she was distraught. She was looking at hospitals in Kansas City to go have her baby at. She didn't know what she was going to do. And it ended up being sort of an emergency situation. And so during dur- under duress, they had to drive her to Pittsburgh. And it was, when you talked to her husband, it was very scary. Hmm. And you mentioned that she was distraught over this. That's certainly something that came through from some of these people that you talked to. They seem to take this very personally, the closing of this hospital. Why do you think that is? So what I found fascinating about this, and, and it, it's probably in small towns across the U.S., these hospitals have been an anchor to the community. They're often the one of the places with the most jobs, some of the best paying jobs. They are places where you go for safety and security. And when this hospital closed, they didn't know if they'd have an emergency department. They didn't know what health care services they would have in the community. And to top it off, Mercy Hospital had been in Fort Scott for 132 years since the town's pioneer days. So it was really part of their DNA. 
And you point out, even with these hospital closures, you point out that rural Americans, they tend to be older, they tend to make less money, and they're more likely to be sick. And and Fort Scott in particular has a lot of smokers. It has a lot of people who are overweight and people with diabetes compared to the rest of Kansas. You uh, spoke with Krista Postai. She's the president and chief executive officer of Community Health Center of Southeast Kansas. And she said that Fort Scott residents die five to 10 years earlier than people in other counties. Uh, chronic disease will get us. Part of this is goes with the depression that goes sometimes with that. Uh, but I, the new generation, I'm seeing less and less smoking. We're seeing it reduced. But part of it's the culture, certainly. In a rural culture, farming, smoking is a right. Krista started her first clinic in a double-wide trailer. Now she has more than 20 locations. Well, you know, I was born here. I'm fifth generation, actually, Southeast Kansas. There's a lot of reasons to recommend Southeast Kansas, but there's a lot of reasons on paper to be extremely worried about us. And we need people to stop talking about and start doing something about it. That's Krista Postai, the CEO of Community Health Center of Southeast Kansas. Um, Now, Sarah Jane, you'd think, based on what she's describing there, that this would be a place a hospital would do really well, that there's a lot of health care needs here. So what have you learned about why, as you say, a 130-year-old hospital ends up having to close? Well, Sarah, what you just said is really intuitive, right? Like, we believe that if we need health care, a hospital should be available to us. But What I found in my reporting is that what we expect from a hospital isn't necessarily what a hospital provides. Hmm. Across the U.S., especially in rural America, many of these hospitals, these are acute care centers. When you get to a hospital, you're usually really sick. You can deliver a baby there. They need surgical wings with, you know, the possibility of being able to put you under when you're delivering a baby. But for the most part, if you're in the hospital, you are sick you are having surgery, you need kind of acute, urgent, traumatic care. What communities across the U.S., whether they're rural or urban, many of them need more primary care services. They need to be um, helped with controlling their diabetes and lifestyle choices that have been passed on from generations before. And this is certainly true in Fort Scott, Kansas. So, uh, Krista Postai, when, when you talked about um, how her her business there is increasing, is that what they're stepping up to try to fill? Yeah. So, Krista Postai's group, is uh, the health center, is one of the largest regional health centers in the U.S., actually. It's, it's something called a federally qualified health care center. And what that means is they can access special funding, extra funding from the federal government for low-income patients if they need to. They can also apply for grant funding and so forth. So they have a little bit more wiggle room in their budget to provide diabetes counseling, you know, healthy food coaching. To I, I talked to one doctor there who was so relieved. He went from the hospital and got a job at CHC. And what it turned out was he had an assistant who could do all the paperwork for him because they had a little bit more money to provide that for him. And so there are some positive silver linings here. Yeah. So is this just a case of changing models? The hospital model that we all are so attached to maybe just doesn't work in this current era? I think that's a very valid question to ask in today's world. Um, Now, when you listen to the podcast, you'll hear people, I ask them, what do you think Fort Scott needs? And I've asked experts across the country this question, too. If you go to the American Hospital Association or the Kansas Hospital Association, there are white papers they've done that analyze the best kind of facility. They include emergency rooms, maybe some sliding um, inpatient beds where people can stay two or three nights and they don't have to leave their small communities. Those are kind of the ideas that are being talked about across America. Hmm. Now, you actually shared with us a snippet of audio. This is from a future episode of Where It Hurts. And this, again, is this new podcast that's a production of Kaiser Health News and St. Louis Public Radio. And Sarah Jane Tribble, who we're talking to today, is its host. And and Sarah, in episode four, you interview Fred Campbell. He's Fort Scott's town historian. And here he is talking about the closure of the Fort Scott Hospital. One of the hardest parts of it all, too, is to to drive by and see the trucks backed up loading out the equipment to take to other Mercy Hospitals as they clean this one out of any and everything they could. Near the end of our visit, Fred wants to know if I think there's any chance that Mercy will come back, or maybe there's another hospital that will take over the now empty building. In my mind, the answer is no. Rural hospitals nationwide are closing, and I'm certain no one wants to take over this one. 
But this gentle giant of a man can't believe that Fort Scott, his once vibrant railroad town, has fallen on such hard times that it can't support a hospital. I don't want to hurt Fred, so I don't answer his question. Instead, I hedge and ask him one more question before I leave. What would he ask Marcy if he had the chance? Are you getting out too soon? That'd be my, my question. With our, our history of, as a community and supporting your efforts, Mercy Corporation, can you stay with us longer and see if we ourselves can't be sustainable with your help? That's Fred Campbell, Fort Scott's town historian. That's almost kind of heartbreaking. Even though they've closed, he just, he almost is is begging them to come back. Was was that hard to hear? Yeah, it was. And and let me draw a a bright line for the St. Louis audience. This is the Mercy Corporation that's based, you know, in outside of St. Louis. And so I did go to St. Louis and interview. um, They offered up Sister uh, Rock, Sister Rockledge, who had founded the Mercy Health System there in St. Louis, and talked to her about that. So that's that episode goes into that journey. And so you were able to talk to her about this. Did she have a good answer? Well, um, should I tell you or should I ask you to <laughs> well, I mean, listen of course, to the episode? We want the scoop, but, <laughs> but maybe you want to save that for, for the episode. When does that episode drop? Uh, that one is episode four, so it drops in about two weeks. Okay, so yeah, we'll we'll go along with this. We'll tell people they need to wait for episode four <laughs> to get the answer to that. But suffice it to say, you're getting some answers from, or you're attempting to get some answers from Mercy, which is based here in St. Louis. And you know, they have had somewhat of a tough go of it lately. They've had some, they've had to lay off some physicians there, which is, is somewhat unusual in a hospital chain. It, it seems like they're they're caught with some much bigger forces. Is that something that, as you've looked at this across the U.S., this isn't just one chain. This is this is a number of, of, of factors that are influencing everybody. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And there's only so much, um, you know, blame to go around, so to speak. If you look at Medicare financing over the decades since it, Medicare was created um, last century, when you talk to experts at Johns Hopkins and other universities across the country, they're saying Medicare payments to hospitals need to be altered and changed. Mm-hmm. Um and this happened in the 1990s when rural hospitals were closing down. And it's time to do it again, they say, because the way um, payment is structured on a kind of a fee for service basis, or even for s- some smaller hospitals called critical access hospitals, there's kind of a, a different payment mechanism. All these, the experts are saying, need to be reevaluated to sort of push forward a new model of care that you and I talked about a few minutes ago, and that is to really fund emergency services in these communities and maybe some sliding beds and so forth. The experts are talking about it. Um, Lawmakers on Capitol Hill have talked about it, yet there's been very little movement on it. Hmm. Well, Sarah Jane, I'm I'm interested in your interest in this. I understand you're originally from this area yourself. How far um, from Fort Scott did you grow up? So my parents farm, if you will, house is about an hour south of Fort Scott. And, you know, I remember going to Fort Scott on school field trips um, to look at the beautiful historic fort. There's a cute downtown there where there's great restaurants. I went into this just already kind of loving the community. Was Was it weird being back as a reporter? It was. It would have been much more weird if it had been my hometown in Parsons. Mm-hmm. But I, at least I was going into a community where I didn't really know anybody. I had some, you know, relatives that lived there, but they weren't part of the story. And um, and so it was good not to know anybody in the community. But it was also nice because I remember the first chamber coffee I went to, I was introduced and they quickly said, well, but she's from southeastern Kansas. So, so that, that maybe opened some doors for you there. I think that, you know, it's one thing for a big city reporter to fly in and do a story on a small town that they don't know anything about. It's another thing for a reporter who's from the area to come and try to kind of seek out the truth as well. And I got to ask you, I mean, you're not based there anymore. You mentioned flying back. How did all this shake out with the timing of the whole country shutting down and then people trying not to get on airplanes? Did you have all the reporting done before the pandemic hit? I did. I did. I know I've called back and talked to folks about the COVID um, hotspots that have pr- 
you know, popped up in Fort Scott uh, more recently. But my reporting really spans from December 2018 through December 2019 for that year. And we follow the lives of folks through that year. Hmm. And of course, as we know, uh, the pandemic didn't start really until, well, at least January. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And, and many of us weren't even paying attention until March, which in retrospect, it's like, <laughs> shouldn't we have been paying attention to that tidal wave over in the corner? But <laughs> a bigger picture for Fort Scott, um, in these first couple episodes here, it, it can seem like so much of the news for these small towns is so depressing. And, and honestly, hearing Fred Campbell, the town historian, it seems like he's almost in denial um, as to how far the stock of some of these places has fallen in America these days. Do you see hope for communities like Fort Scott and, and like the place where you grew up? So Fort Scott itself is full of very vibrant people. And it's, a, it's as I mentioned, there's a historic fort there. U.S. Cemetery One is there, one of the first cemeteries created in the U.S. with uh, Civil War soldiers in it. Um, there is a lot of stuff in Fort Scott that people feel very proud of. And I think it would be tragic for these small towns to be just kind of leftovers. Krista Postai talks about this in the podcast. But I also do think there's a lot of people like Krista and others who love these communities and have a lot of hope. And if you say, look at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, they do analytics and studies on health outcomes and health outreach in these communities. There are efforts in small towns across Missouri, Kansas, across the U.S., where they're trying to connect the dots, improve lives, and take advantage of some of those really wonderful things that you can find in rural America, like, you know, getting off work and not having to commute 45 minutes home, but Mm -hmm. instead just going straight to your kid's baseball game and enjoying the evening. Right. So there there are silver linings. It's just there's been so many generations of poor health and loss of jobs that it's going to be a little bit more difficult. Sarah Jane, I want to squeeze in just one call here. We have a caller who's who's uh, wants to join us with what feels like a pretty good question. So let's this might be the last question of this interview, but let's hear from Max, who's calling from the Veronica Park neighborhood. Um, Max, hi, you're on St. Louis on the air. Yeah, good afternoon. You were sort of talking around this. Uh, My point is these little hospitals did not start off being part of a chain. Over the years, the chains have bought up these little hospitals. Must have been profitable to buy them up. Then they closed them. And uh, I don't know, a hospital that's delivering over 200 babies a year, it seems like I don't know how that can be close. So if you could explain how that's been going on, and i got to make a comment. When I see commercials in this political season talking about government-run health care programs are closing these little hospitals down, I think what we need is more government-run stuff to keep these little hospitals open. Well, Max, thank you for that. Uh, Max just packed a lot into that. Last question there, Sarah Jane. Um, but yeah. I'm curious about your thoughts about this consolidation. Do you did your reporting find that that has played a big role? Yeah, I mean, I've been a healthcare reporter off and on for 20 some years, and I started out in Wichita, Kansas, and have worked across the country. So, you know, I can't tell you how many stories I've done over the years about consolidation in healthcare systems. And Max is right. This hospital started in 19, no, 1886, and over the years, it joined the Mercy Health System because of consolidation and because. Many of these hospitals had to meet demands um, for electronic filing, for um, Medicare reimbursement, Medicaid hmm. reimbursement. And to step up for that and meet those demands, it was easier to consolidate with other groups who also had those capabilities. Um, and th- there is one other point uh, Max brings up, and it, very great questions, all of them. And as I as I worked on this story, I kept thinking, well, if I'm spending my taxpayer dollars on these federal programs, I want them to work, mm-hmm. right? Like if, if all of us are having money pulled out of our paychecks for Medicare and what have you, I want that money to go to good use. And so when I think about the money's already going out there. So let's just make sure it's working. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like some things are going to have to change if we expect uh, to have the, the kind of health care that we're going to need going forward. So there is a lot to think about in this podcast. I want to encourage people to check this out. It's called Where It Hurts. Um, you can find it on our website. That's stlpublicradio.org. And you can also find it wherever you get your podcasts. So Sarah Jane Tribble, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me.
If you learned something new from today's episode, consider leaving us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the easiest way to help people discover our show. We appreciate it. Thank you. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, saluting Earth Day on April 22nd with an ongoing commitment to help offset carbon emissions with sustainable harvesting of Missouri forests. Details at ChooseWood.com.